This Week in Virology, the podcast about viruses, the kind that make you sick. From Microbe TV, this is TWIV, This Week in Virology, episode 899, recorded on May 12, 2022. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and you're listening to the podcast all about viruses. Joining me today from New York, Daniel Griffin. Hello, everyone. And we'll, we'll be talking about COVID, one of those viruses that makes you sick. <laughs> you mean SARS-CoV-2? Actually, you're right. Can you believe that? <laughs> it's okay. That's no, I think right. that's no. good. SARS-CoV-2, the virus it, that makes you sick. And when you're sick, we call it COVID. So the other aspect of this is that people said, oh, I, I tested positive. I have COVID. You don't have COVID unless you have symptoms, right? That's that's becoming like an interesting issue. And I think maybe we'll get into that today. All right. Uh, so, all right, let's start off with our quotation. Um, How poor are they that have not patience? What wound did ever heal but by degrees? Thou knowest we work by wit and not by witchcraft. And wit depends on dilatory time. And that's uh, that's Shakespeare. Wow. Um, and, and no worry, Shakespeare's, Shakespeare's got another uh, quotation about sort of rushing. And I think that involves if you're going to try to assassinate someone. But I think this is more um, appropriate if you're trying to gain knowledge, um, if you're trying to move forward. Um, so that'll be a theme I try to hit on a few times uh, in today's episode. Um, but I think as everyone knows, the virus is everywhere. There's lots and lots of SARS-CoV-2. Um, But deaths um, per day are still sitting at the lowest they have since the pandemic started. We're still sitting in that two or 250 deaths per day in the United States. So just keep that in mind. That's the the best we've ever done. Um, I will comment for the week ending 5-5-22, eight more children died. So we're actually down to about one um, pediatric death per day here in the U.S., Um, Still waiting for vaccines for those under five um, and really much in the way of uh, therapeutics for those under 12. Um, uh, we do have remdesivir and we'll, we'll mention that. But let's get right into uh, children. Children are at risk for COVID. Um, and it does look like June, it looks like next month be, may be the month for kids and COVID vaccines. Um, and I'm going to start off with an, an article evaluation of mRNA-1273, that's Moderna, COVID-19 vaccine in children 6 to 11 years of age, um, published in the New England Journal of Medicine. So these are the results. Um, now the peer-reviewed published results of the Kid Cove uh, study group. Uh, I'm going to focus on part two of the trial where 4,016 children were randomly assigned to receive two injections of the mRNA-1273 of the Moderna, 50 micrograms each or placebo, and were followed for a median of 82 days um, after the first injection. So sort of do your math there. Um, This dose level was associated with mainly low-grade transient adverse events. So, you know, injection site pain, headache, fatigue, no vaccine-related serious adverse events in this uh, group. No multi-system inflammatory syndrome in children, no myocarditis, no pericarditis reported in this group at this dose. Well, what about efficacy? Um, At least per this study, among children who did not have evidence of SARS-CoV-2 infection at baseline, um, the estimates of vaccine efficacy against against symptomatic SARS-CoV-2 infection Um, at least 14 days after the first injection were 91.8%, according to the definition used in the phase three COVE trial involving adults, with um, 0.1% in the mRNA-1273 group and 1.7% in the placebo group. Um, I've now decided every time the word vaccine efficacy is is used, um, every reviewer should force them to define what efficacy they're talking about. the estimated vaccine efficacy against asymptomatic SARS-CoV-2 infection. How does that work in the same sentence? Do they have an <laughs> infection if they're asymptomatic? Going to get to that. Was So efficacy against really a positive PCR, positive test, was 62.5%. 
Um, and so that was basically 2.5% um, in the mRNA um, vaccinated group, 1% in the placebo group. Um, now, one caveat there is uh, this trial is really telling us about efficacy um, of the vaccine when Delta was the predominant circulating variant. So we're always, you know, a variant or so behind. Um, but I think this is an interesting concept that um, maybe, maybe Vincent, maybe you and I can talk about this a little, the concept of we used to always, before we had such sensitive uh, testing techniques, always associate infection with symptoms. And now what we're having here, and I know we talked about on the PUSCast about um, influenza inf infections, those that were asymptomatic versus symptomatic. So it's almost like the language is evolving with our technology. Vincent? Well, there was a period when we did serological assays. Before we had PCR, you could do serological surveys. And for some viruses, you always found a higher number of people who apparently were infected, but they don't recall ever having symptoms. Now, that's an imprecise kind of study, but that led to this initial idea that for some viruses, and polio virus was one of the first, you know, 99% of infections are either asymptomatic or largely asymptomatic, and only 1% are paralytic. So I think we could do it with less precision when we did serology, but now with PCR, we really know you're infected, but you don't have any symptoms. And a symptom is, of course, what you only can feel. Yes, a sign yes. is what is what can be measured. So all infections have a sign because one sign would be RNA viral load, yep. right? But the symptom is what you feel. And the, the other aspect of it, Daniel, is that for some people, they have a low barrier to symptoms. My head is killing me. And for others... <laughs> I'm fine, right? <laughs> yeah, I still, I still always, when we talk about symptoms, Greg, I still remember the guy I treated in the ICU as a resident who was sitting there with uh, sweat on his brow, focused. He looked like he was in a bad way. He rated his pain four out of 10, said it was not quite as bad as when he was gut shot in NOM. So yes, <laughs> everyone has a different threshold. Yes. All right. Uh, so the next question, does COVID present the same in kids as it does in adults? And one big feature we often see in adults is loss of smell. We've talked a little bit about how that's different with different variants. So the paper prevalence of anosmia in 10,157 pediatric COVID-19 cases, multicenter study from Turkey, was published in the Pediatric Infectious Disease Journal. Um, this multi-center prospective cohort study uh, was conducted with pediatric infection clinics, kind of an interesting, 37 centers in 19 different cities of Turkey uh, between October 2020 and March 2021. Um, here, anosmia was present in only 12.5% um, of the cases in the 10 to 18-year-olds. Um, so it's really interesting, right? Um, because I keep getting back to what I harp on is the only way you know what virus a person has is by going ahead and doing that test. Um, you can't just guess on symptoms. You can't just say, oh, well, you still have intact. And I hear this all the time from the patients. Don't be this clinician um, that I'm getting called about where they say, you know, I told the clinician and he said, it doesn't sound like COVID. <laughs> <laughs> It all sounds like COVID. During a pandemic, if you've got a viral illness, it is that viral illness until proven otherwise. All right. So th this study, Daniel, from Turkey, though, you know, they say it's lower than in adults, but they really should have done the adults at the same time because you may... <laughs> Be different, right? You you are you are correct, and and I think that's one of the big things we we talk about. You know, even when we compare efficacy of different therapeutics, you really need to do the same the, it all in the same study because there's so many variables during this period of time um, with this type of questioning. Would the would the adults have been at twelve point five percent? You can't just look at another study in a different population. Yeah. So I think that's correct. All right. So now the pre-exposure period when we talk about transmission and testing, um, never miss an opportunity to test. And Occam was not a physician. John Hickam was a patient going to have two things at the same time. Um, I actually have several patients in the hospital now with flu and COVID. Uh, it's actually interesting. One man was quite ill and um, we were 
a couple doors down in the ICU discussing the case with the ICU team and the patient right behind us who was obviously listening in. We need to be more careful about this. Um, he said, I, I have flu and COVID too. <laughs> so, <laughs> so yes, this is not uncommon. Um, now, what I mentioned last time is that we have really dropped the number of tests that are being done um, in a manner where they end up getting reported, right? There surely are a bunch of those home tests going on. Well, the CDC is expanding their national wastewater surveillance, um, and it will be challenging as we learn about this new approach to coordinate this. Um, there's a lot of challenges getting it done. Um, there's also going to be challenges understanding what these results actually mean. Um, hopefully, we'll go forward. But as we stop getting um, case numbers and other information, um, this may be a resource that we have to start looking at. So just heads up on that. All right. couple. I have some really fun papers today. Um, the first fun paper, Detection of SARS-CoV-2 by Canine Olfaction, a pilot study published in Open Forum Infectious Disease. Um, in this double-blinded case control validation study, sweat samples from inpatients and outpatients were obtained and tested for SARS-CoV-2 by PCR. Interesting. So they're actually getting um, SARS-CoV-2 PCR positivity from sweat samples. Now, medical detection dogs were trained to distinguish SARS-CoV-2 positive samples from SARS-CoV-2 negative samples using reward-based reinforcement. That's you give them food, um, treats, <laughs> kibble. Um, and it's just a little bit of kibble. They don't get a big dog bone, by the way. So samples were obtained from 584 individuals, 6 to 97 years of age, 24% positive SARS-CoV-2 samples, 76% negative SARS-CoV-2 samples. Um, in the testing phase, all dogs performed with high accuracy in detecting SARS-CoV-2. Overall diagnostic sensitivity was 98%. Specificity, 92%. And this is where it gets exciting. In a follow-up phase, one dog, and that was Tess, a two-year-old Labrador. Um, we're going to get back to her. Um, she screened 153 patients for SARS-CoV-2 in a hospital setting with 96% sensitivity and 100% specificity. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, just for our dog lovers, and I am one of those, uh, four dogs were involved in this training. We had three labs. We had one golden retriever ranging from one to five. Um, the, the dogs were, were Yuki, who was one year old, Tess, the star of the show, who was two, Sadie, who was five, and then Samson was the golden retriever. Uh, they were trained for six weeks for a total training time of 20 hours over these six weeks, so about 30 minutes per day. Uh, this training was done in Maui. Uh, so if we have any dogs listening, they may want to sign up for six weeks in Maui to develop this wonderful skill. That, Daniel, what are they going to do with this? <laughs> Are they going to put them in airports and sniff people to see if they're positive? <laughs> you know, there's been, a, there's been a bunch of ideas about how to potentially do this. So that's one. You could use them at airports. You can use them outside of an event. Um, you could maybe even use them in schools, right? You could have mm. the kids sort of, you know, moving past, and you know, the dog sniffs each person before they go in. Um, I mean, there's a lot of ideas. It, there are some challenges, right? Um, you know, it does, uh, a dog can only work for about 45 minutes and then they need a break. So if you've got, you know, too many people, you're going to need a, a few dogs. Um, <laughs> but uh, along this line, we have another, <laughs> another in the canine arena, the paper screening for SARS-CoV-2 persistence hmm. in long COVID patients using sniffer dogs and scents from axillary sweat samples published in the Journal of Clinical Trials. So can our dogs now tell who has long COVID and who might be malingering? So here the researchers, again, took axillary sweat samples from long COVID patients and healthy controls and then had two trained dogs um, to see if they could tell them apart. Now, the dogs identified half of the patients who reported they had long COVID, and they did not flag any of the normal sweat samples. So I, uh, as I say here, I now understand what people mean when they say something passes the sniff test. Hmm. So, so I, I think this would be great for me to use in my clinic when they're trying to deny disability. I'm like, I'm sorry, but the dog has confirmed the long yeah, COVID in this indeed. individual. So what is it that they're smelling in long COVID patients, Daniel? You know, so I don't know. And I think that's really apparently these volatile organic compounds. That's the theory. Um, yeah. But we really don't know. We really don't know. I mean, ideally, 
we will identify what are the potential volatile organic compounds. That's like hand waving. Um, and then know that that's what they're picking up. Um, because of course, as much as we all love dogs, um, you know, the, uh, the idea of being able to have something objective that you can show maybe on some sort of, uh, machine or, or scan or something. I just don't want people to think that this means that there's virus present. Okay. It could be volatiles produced by immune responses, right? I mean, that would be my main suspicion, right? I mean, there's nowhere in here that they're saying that these people with long COVID with the axillary sweat samples have um, viable infectious virus in their sweat. Right. Um, so yeah, I think that's actually a really important, uh, important point for people to be thinking about. All right. And I will say, right, as we sort of, you know, hopefully we're going to keep training these dogs, um, training them up for the the fall and the winter surge. Um, but globally, testing is plunging um, about 70 to 90 percent drop from um, the first to the second quarter here. Um, and as I keep telling um, providers, I'm hoping that we're just putting uh, things um, in storage, getting ready uh, for the next surge, that we're not going to just say, oh, it's over because we keep doing that. Um, so let's let's not go into the fall and next winter without being ready. All right, we're still in that section of transmission. So just to reinforce, um, you know, one-way masking is something that we're now talking about, uh, reducing those exposures, um, outdoors versus indoors, better ventilation. Um, but I really enjoyed uh, reading COVID-19 Risk Assessment for Public Events that was created by the University of Texas COVID-19 Modeling Consortium. Uh, this is 17 pages, so a quick read. I did not read all of it. It, it is not as quick a read. Uh, there's a lot of tables and things in there. Um, but a few highlights, and, and Vincent, I'm going to pull you in here. I'm, I'm working you hard today. Um, mm -hmm. <laughs> this uh, report considered two case studies in Travis County. That's down in Austin, Texas. Um, I think we we have a buddy who lives down there. Yeah, um, that'd be Rich Condit. Yep. <laughs> yeah. So maybe I don't know if Rich went to any of these um, these high risk uh, venues, but we'll have to ask him next week. Um, one was a business conference with three thousand attendees. Uh, two was an outdoor festival with fifty thousand attendees. Um, remember, this is modeling, right? So I just want to point that out as we go through this. So what were sort of the highlights, the bullet points that they presented? So. They were suggesting that testing requirements before the event um, were more effective uh, at preventing attendees from arriving infected than vaccine requirements. So that may vary, actually, with different um, variants, I will say. So for the business conference case study, right, so this is the slightly smaller indoor event. This is about 3,000 attendees indoor. They compared entry testing, a negative test within 48 hours prior to the event, to a vaccine requirement um, that results in 95% of attendees vaccinated. Their modeling suggested that the testing policy would re re result in an estimated 20 attendees arriving infected. The vaccination would result in an estimated 30. Um, big, you know, big overlap on the confidence um, intervals here. So they were also commenting that if you shortened that testing window to 24 hours prior to the event, that would perhaps reduce the risks further. And then, and I think this is sort of combining multiple mitigation strategies could effectively prevent transmission at events, sort of putting things together. Now, what about the outdoor event? Remember, this is going to be 50,000 people at an outdoor festival. Um, so here they say a combination of vaccination, entry testing, and face mask requirements um, was estimated to reduce the number of infections stemming from the event in the subsequent four weeks uh, from 895, which would be predicted, down to 120. Um, so I did the math on this. Um, so we're looking at a little less than 2% down to 0.2%. Um, so sort of this idea as we're looking here, outdoor events are safer than indoor events. Um, they say, although the hypothetical outdoor festival would be over 10 times the size of the hypothetical business conference, they estimated that it would produce only double the number of infections within the community during and following the event. So a bunch of things to say here. Um, one is this is a modeling study. These, these did not occur. This is not, you know, actual data. This is modeling. Um, but as we start having these events, um, I will suggest that all we've learned um, really supports the idea that you can do these in a safer way. And I am going to also say in a more cost effective manner, um, if you start moving things to outdoor venues. So let's say, for instance, 
Theoretically, there was a large mandatory event for hundreds of healthcare providers and administrators with short talks that none of us could hear because of the bad acoustics. Then following, there was some food, drinks, socializing. Um, this was all done inside, mostly without people wearing um, masks, without testing. Um, you know, we would anticipate, we would not be surprised if dozens of people were then out of work for a minimum of five days each. Um, all that human suffering that goes with um, having a symptomatic um, case um, of this virus, a uh, nice cost to the bottom line with all those uh, providers not being able to take care of their patients and all those patients being frustrated that they can't um, take, um, can't be taken care of. Um, you know, you could move that socializing um, part to a beautiful outdoor area that was maybe adjacent to this huge conference room. Maybe there'd even be better acoustics out there so people could stand that three to six feet apart outdoors and converse, uh, potentially fewer infections, fewer dollars lost in revenue, less impact on patient care, et cetera, et cetera. So people are starting to do these events. Um, this is probably that time to call up your friendly ID doc and ask for a little guidance so that you're not having this impact after the fact. But Vincent. <laughs> Comments? Well, my first thought is we don't do this for influenza, do we? <laughs> true, true. And I I would submit that, you know, COVID is becoming another influenza. There's, there are clearly some differences still, uh, but, you know, it's just not clear to me why we would do this. For the two issues, if you want to wear a mask at a conference, it really Im impairs communication. And so I think if if you really think we're in a phase where it's it's not a good idea to be infected, then you should do your conferences online still uh, and wait for the time when, and I don't know when it's going to be, what, when there's less circulation. There's always going to be high circulation in the winter. I'm not sure what's going to attenuate disease. So um, I, I think the, the, the idea that you have to have masks and be vaccinated and distance, it's all great but I'm not sure we need it. I think this is a good conversation for us to have because is this sustainable? Is it sustainable every time a person gets um, SARS-CoV-2 infected that they spend five days isolated, unable to work? Is that, you know, I mean, and I think that yeah, becomes an yeah. issue. No, I, I don't think that's realistic at all going forward, especially as this approaches, you know, influenza, where yeah. we don't do those things. We do not test we only test for influenza to know if it's flu so we can give Tammy flu, right? Yeah. Yep. But we and then don't... we don't say now you have to stay home for five no. days. And when you come back, you have to wear a, you know, tight fitting mask for the next five. And I worry about the impact, you know, summer, summer's coming up, right? We're going to have summer camps. What are we going to do with the amount of virus we have circulating? Are we going to have all these kids locked in isolation cabins, you know, five yes. days here, five days there? Um, I think that, you know, it's not going to get much better. I was having a conversation with my parents because I, I may um, encourage them to attend an indoor event upcoming. Um, <laughs> <laughs> by the way, this is how they find out, right? They listen to Brian Lair or they listen to Web and they're like, whoa, what are we going to? <laughs> so, um, you know, how much better is it going to get, right? We have, we have highly effective vaccines. We now are having, uh, for the immunocompromised, we've actually gone a little bit farther. We now have Evushell passive vaccination. Yep. Um, right. We have really good access to Paxlovid and some other therapeutics that we'll talk about. Um, I, I'm not sure how much better it gets. Um, and so I think at some point we've got to start um, asking ourselves about what should the what should the consequence be? Um, because for a lot of these people, they actually did not get that sick. The big consequence was you're out of work for five days and all the disruption that that creates. Yeah. Well, that's because we make them be out of work because they test positive, right? Yeah. But we don't have to do that. I think, Daniel, there are two issues that are driving this. First is the under five not being able to be vaccinated. And I know they're not going to be at these conferences, but the people may go home to kids and, and that's a risk for them. And the other one is really the elephant in the room. It's long COVID. People are really afraid of long COVID, getting a mild infection post-vaccination and still getting long COVID. And I think we need to sort that out and, and know yeah. what the risk really is. I, I don't think we do yet. 
Yeah. And I, I think that's relevant, right? We keep talking about data where post-vaccination, it, it seems to be reduced as far as risk and severity, but it's not zero. And also we don't have great treatments. We have, well, really no evidence-based treatment other than saying, hey, go get vaccinated. That might help. So yeah. So may, maybe there is still a little bit that will get better. But yeah, for a lot of people, that is the elephant in the room, the long COVID. And the other is, hey, what about these kids under five? We're almost there. We hope. We hope next month we're going to be able to start uh, getting those kids vaccinated. So, all right. But I think it's important that we keep having these conversations. Where are we? What are we doing? And I think we can have them civilly. It doesn't have to be, you know, partisan, one person screaming at the other, you know, with and without a mask. Yeah. Oh, yes, I agree. <laughs> <laughs> all right. <laughs> all right. Active vaccination. Never miss an opportunity to vaccinate. Um, so R1 and done, maybe done, <laughs> limited at least. Uh, so the FDA released uh, the update on May 5th, 20. 20. Um, actually, that was right when we were recording last time. I think they did it as we were recording. But coronavirus COVID-19 update, FDA limits use of Janssen COVID-19 vaccine to certain individuals. Um, and I'm going to read this and then kind of really point out, it's, it's pretty targeted what they're saying here. The U.S. FDA has limited the authorized use of the Janssen COVID-19 vaccine to individuals 18 years of age and older for whom other authorized or approved COVID-19 vaccines are not accessible or clinically appropriate. Okay. So this isn't just, oh, by the way, you still have a choice. We prefer the others. This is actually saying the authorization, the EUA, your access to this vaccine um, is only limited to situations where a person um, cannot get another vaccine. So that's a pretty pretty big restriction. Um, they the focus of the release is the rare but clearly identified association with the risk of thrombosis with thrombocytopenia syndrome, vaccine induced. Um, but I also have to say, there's growing evidence that the mRNA vaccines are just more effective. Daniel, is there a patient population where TTS is a real potential issue? You know, it is it is very rare. You know, and initially we had sort of ideas that we could say, oh, it was a certain sex, a certain age. Um, by the time all the numbers came in, it was kind of all over there. There isn't a really good way to know ahead of time who would be the person at risk. And that that presents the challenge. Okay. Um, another fun paper, the article, Recall of B-Cell Memory Depends on Relative Locations of Prime and Boost Immunization, published in Science Immunology. Um, I know there's discussion. Maybe this will come up on immune as a deep dive. I hope. Um, so here's the question. If I got my first COVID vaccine in my left shoulder, can I just pop the second one in my right thigh, in my right shoulder, or am I better off just putting them both in the same place? So this is a mouse study. The, uh, the researchers used a prime boost immunization approach whereby mice received a homologous antigen booster on the same or the opposite leg. Um, the magnitude and serum antibody responses were similar um, for same side versus opposite side boosters. However, same side boosters elicited better quality germinal centers with higher avidity for antigen, higher immunoglobulin mutation frequencies, and increased recall of B cells from primary germinal centers. These results indicate that the reactivation of local memory B cells generates superior secondary germinal center responses and suggest that localization of booster immunization should be considered in vaccination strategies. So what do you think, Daniel? Same arm? Yeah, for now, why not? I mean, what is <laughs> I, the what is the difference? I mean, is it 1%? Is it 1x2? I, I can't tell from this. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm hoping there'll be a deep dive. I, I think there was some interest from our immune colleagues uh, back and forth on Twitter about this. So I'm hoping we get a little bit of a, a, a deeper dive. But I never liked my left arm anyway, so it's getting all the shots. <laughs> all right, passive vaccination, have you shelled? Um, and we're doing a little better, I think, here. Um, what about instead of pre-exposure prophylaxis, we just wait. Let's wait. Let's give uh, Evusheld after the fact. Let's give it as treatment. So here, the preprint, um, tixagevimab, silgavimab for treatment of hospitalized COVID-19 patients, a randomized double-blind phase three trial was posted on the Lancet preprint server. Um, so this is, as I mentioned, um, 
let's not just wait until after they get infected, but let's actually wait and wait. Let's wait till they end up in the hospital. Let's wait till they're starting to get past the viral replication phase. Let's wait till they get into the early inflammatory phase. Then let's give them Evusheld. So I start thinking about this. Oh, this this just this doesn't seem like a good idea. So these are the results of a phase three blinded randomized placebo controlled trial um, where adults hospitalized for COVID-19 at 81 sites on four continents were assigned to receive intravenous Abushell, 300 milligrams or placebo. So this is the new higher dose in addition to remdesivir and other standard of care. So we have 1,417 in the primary modified intent to treat population infused with the Ebushel 710, placebo 707. Um, by day 90, sustained recovery was achieved by 87% who got the Ebushel, 84% who got placebo. Um, results were similar in the zero negative group. And I think that's something to point. So people who are still antibody negative versus people who are antibody positive results were similar, but here mortality was lower in the EBU shelled 8.6% versus placebo at 12.2%. Uh, so a hazard ratio of 0 0.70. Um, I was a bit surprised that they were seeing the statistically significant 30% reduction in mortality because they just kept waiting. Um, a few details I will say, and I think this is important. Um, the median was eight days of symptoms. So they weren't really waiting until completely after the viral replication. So this is consistent with the concept of giving monoclonals within the first 10 days. We're not seeing that 80 to 90% improvement that we saw if you get it you know, upfront in the first five or six, but we're still seeing a little bit because we're still within the first 10 days. Um, but I think this really builds on the idea that those antiviral therapies, you really want to try to get them started as soon as possible. Um, and I did want to point out that, you know, I know there's a bunch of thought leaders out there I want to call them that, influencers that have been sort of suggesting, well, why don't we wait a little? Maybe we're treating people too soon. Let's let's give their body a chance to see that virus. Let's let that uh, that that response start. Then we jump in with the antivirals and we'll be even better. So I'm, I'm a little concerned that this is the Dunning-Kruger effect. Um, there's no data to suggest that we should wait. And there's actually lots of data to suggest that the earlier we start treatment, um, the better um, impact we get. So here I'm going to quote Shakespeare again. And in this case, the opposite message, if it were done when tis done, then to a well, it were done quickly. Except to here, we are talking about assassinating the virus rather than King Duncan. So if we do plan to kill the virus, let's get it done quickly. If we're trying to learn and move forward with science, then we need to take a little bit of time and not just throw darts at the board. All right. The post-exposure period, uh, we don't have much here um, except for testing so that we can pick up when we have moved from that into the period of detectable viral replication phase or the viral symptom phase. So um, very similar here, but we have a few sort of tools. Um, number one, number one recommended thing if someone uh, tests positive is Paxlovid for those at high risk of progression, an 89 to 88% reduction in progression if given in the first three to five days. Um, what are the new tools? The IDSA, the ID Society of America, has created a Paxlovid patient eligibility screening checklist for prescribers. Um, this is actually, they've linked to an FDA.gov um, source. Um, this is pretty nice. I've already seen people building this into their electronic medical records where they can click through and go through the, the checklist. Um, although we're still waiting for more data, um, Paxlovid only has an EUA for those who are at high risk for progression to severe COVID-19, including hospitalization or death. Um, we still do not know if Paxlovid prevents long COVID or even makes it worse, let's be honest here. Um, there's a number of things we still don't know about. We're still waiting to get that knowledge. So uh, just encouraging people, instead of throwing darts at a board, um, we should be making evidence-based recommendations based on what we know. Um, the second thing, which is, is helpful, um, the CDC has a list of what makes a person at risk of progression um, to severe COVID. I'm actually going to click on this link and go through it a little bit because I actually have to say um, the number of things on this list is actually pretty extensive. 
So I'm moving it off to the side so I can go through it here. So just to go through a few things which I'm going to sort of highlight, cancer, um, but it's probably active cancer, probably not prior. Chronic kidney disease, liver disease, lung disease, cystic fibrosis, dementia or neurological conditions, diabetes, that could be type 1 or type 2. Um, disabilities. This is actually a pretty broad. They say people with learning disabilities, people with ADHD. Um, it's actually pretty extensive here. Down syndrome, um, heart diseases, HIV, immunocompromised, uh, mental health issues. They even say, and this is interesting, they say overweight and obesity. They're actually clearly saying here, BMI of 25 um, is in this list. This one I thought was a little interesting, physical inactivity. So for those, those of us who aren't um, exercising enough, really interesting that this is in their list that they link to. Um, smoking, uh, transplants, prior stroke, substance abuse disorders, um, rather extensive list. So I do want to point that out, that it's actually becoming a challenge to find someone who, who doesn't have a risk factor, who doesn't uh, qualify from that um, standpoint. The other thing is another nice tool, and we'll have links to this, is the idsociety.org forward slash Paxlovid, where they go through the top 100 prescribed drugs and then guide you on what you should do. There's only a couple drugs that are really like bright orange, don't do this, um, you know, avoid Paxlovid in these. Um, but a lot of guidance, for instance, the statins, they say hold the statins while you're on Paxlovid and then for another five days and can start. And then they go through a number of others. So I've actually been using this quite frequently. Um, it's helpful because a lot of concerns about what do I do with the other med medications a higher risk person might be on. Next thing I will go, remdesivir. Remember, this has moved up to number two, that three-day early IV data suggesting an 87% reduction in progression if given in the first five days. Monoclonals are down at three, beptilovimab. We don't have efficacy, but we do have the extrapolation. Uh, Thor's hammer, malnupiravir, our last option here, 30% reduction. Um, remember, the only one for those kids 28 days up to 12 is going to be your remdesivir. So we need to make sure that that's something we have available for the high-risk kids. Um, remember to avoid steroids. Uh, given early, that can actually um, lead to a higher risk of progression. Zinc gives you GI distress without much help. And are you ready? No role for ivermectin. Yes. Uh, just filter out these hate mails for me. I don't need, you don't need to forward these to me there, Vincent. But the article, Effective Early Treatment with Ivermectin Among Patients with COVID-19, has been peer-reviewed and now published in the New England Journal of Medicine. These are the results of the double-blind, randomized, placebo-controlled adaptive platform trial involving symptomatic SARS-CoV-2 positive adults recruited from 12 public health clinics in Brazil. Treatment with ivermectin did not result in a lower incidence of medical admission to a hospital due to progression of COVID-19 or of prolonged emergency department observation among outpatients with an early diagnosis of COVID-19. So not looking um, encouraging for ivermectin. All right, isolation and quarantine. Now, this is a question I get multiple times a day. So uh, maybe this is another one of my attempts to uh, save, save myself from the flood of emails. Dr. Griffin, I tested positive. Uh, what do I need to do? Um, so when people, and they always say this, how long does this patient need to quarantine after they test positive? And I always say, first off, please, isolation for the infected, quarantine for the exposed, words matter. Um, so first off, we still do have quarantine rules for people not up to date with their vaccine. So I don't know if people listen closely, not up to date, that, that's different than fully vaccinated. So this is a new term um, that maybe people are not familiar with, the distinction between fully vaccinated and up to date with vaccines. Um, you are up to date with your COVID-19 vaccines when you have received all doses in the primary series and one booster when eligible. Um, fully vaccinated is just the primary series. So fully vaccinated people still quarantine. Up to date people do not have to quarantine. Uh, I'm not sure the science is compelling on that, but them's the rules. Now, if you are not up to date after an exposure, you are supposed to quarantine for at least five days and then take precautions up to day 10. If you're up to date, then no quarantine. I'm pretty sure that the people who are unvaccinated and not up to date are not following that rule. But anyway, them's the rules. Now, isolation for the infected. 
if you are infected, one stays home for five days, um, isolated, and then if fever-free for 24 hours, you take precautions until day 10. You can leave isolation, but the recommendation is wear a well-fitting mask until the 10 full days are done. No testing out early or even extending, you know, if on day 10 you get that positive antigen test. Um, and I think we started to have this discussion before, but Vincent, I, is there a time when we're going to stop doing this? Are these recommendations only for unvaccinated people who are not up to date or not fully vaccinated? Is that the idea? So actually, that's interesting. The quarantine, if you are up to date with your vaccines, there is no quarantine. It's gone. The only people that quarantine are people who are not up to date, so the unvaccinated or the just fully vaccinated, lumping them together. So Now, the isolation right. for the infected, that's everybody. Okay. So if you test positive, you need to isolate. And so here it says five days, and then if you're fever-free for 24 hours, you're good to go, right? Good to go. But if you go back to the workplace or to school um, or out and about, you're supposed to be wearing a tight-fitting mask um, at all times when you might be exposing others. Right. So your question, how are we going to be doing this forever? No, obviously not. People are not going to stand for this. How long are we going to do it? What's the determinant of how long we are going to do this? Because we do not do this with influenza. With And for flu, we have less effective vaccines, right? <laughs> Yes. <laughs> <laughs> these are these are much better vaccines. So I, 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 it seems to me that um, unless you're thinking about the less than five year olds, uh, this isn't necessary any longer. Yeah. I mean, I think this is something that, you know, and both sides. Right. I, I think that we do have a lot of division in our country, but I, I think that this should be a sober conversation about as we move forward particularly as we get past June, when do we when do we start changing the rules on this? Because this is a big deal. It discourages people from testing. It discourages yes. people from, you know, honestly, um, you know, so. All right. So that's a, that's a big thing. And I think we can have a science-based discussion um, that hopefully informs policy as opposed to the other way where policy just sort of gets dropped down. All right. Early inflammatory phase. Um, so this is where um, the, some people progress. They start to get that early inflammatory phase. Perhaps they start to get hypoxemia, so their oxygen saturation drops below 94%. Um, that's when some of these individuals may end up in the hospital, started on steroids, six milligrams per day times 10 days. Those individuals whose oxygen saturation does not drop, we are not seeing a benefit here. So um, not recommending it, only in the select group that it's appropriate. Anticoagulation, just to keep this very simple, those who are admitted to hospital with critical illness, those ICU patients, prophylactic intensity anticoagulation. So that's the low dose. If you're using low, if you are using low molecular weight heparin, that's 40 milligrams subcutaneous once per day, weight-based adjusted as needed, um, renal um, with pharmacy involved. What about those individuals who are less ill, who are up on the floor, who are not critically ill and in the ICU or requiring ICU level care? The recommendation is actually higher level one milligram per kilogram subcutaneous twice a day of the low molecular weight heparin, the anoxaparin, for instance, um, because these people, you can get away with reducing their risk of clotting without having that excess bleeding risk of those in the ICU. So these are updates. These are changes. Um, I know some systems are using D-dimers to sort of inform and make these decisions. Um, and number three, this is important, um, the national guidelines are no anticoagulation outpatient thromboprophylaxis. So you send them home not on anticoagulants unless they have a high-risk feature. And of course, use your judgment. I had a woman today in her 90s, um, really has a horrible um, opened uh, breast cancer area, concerns about bleeding. So we did not put her on full dose. So you really got to, you got to see the patient, you've got to weigh the risks um, because we can provide some benefit, but also uh, these are medicines that can have uh, associated risks. Pulmonary support, um, maybe remdesivir if we're early enough. Um, tocilizumab, in some cases, baricitinib, um, and things to avoid. Uh, no ivermectin, no zinc, um, no antibiotics unless it's appropriate. Um, and one of the big things, and I'm going to go right into this, is what about 
uh, bacterial co-infection. How do we determine who might need those antibiotics? So the paper pro-calcitonin is not a reliable biomarker of bacterial co-infection in people with coronavirus disease, 2019, undergoing microbiological investigation at the time of hospital admission was published in Open Forum Infectious Disease. That's the Open Access Journal of the IDSA. Um, the authors start by pointing out that only about 5% of people with COVID-19 present with bacterial co-infection, yet 75% receive antibiotics. They found that among hospitalized patients with COVID-19, procalcitonin did not reliably identify people with positive microbiological findings. Low concentrations were observed in some with co-infection and high concentrations in some without. Um, so I just want to remind people of that ferritin procalcitonin ratio. Don't just look at procalcitonin in isolation. Um, that was the uh, paper my friend Leland Shapiro published, um, Open Forum Infectious Disease, Diagnostic Utility of a Ferritin to Procalcitonin Ratio to Differentiate Patients with COVID-19 from Those with Bacterial Pneumonia, a multi-center study. Um, in this analysis, they use this ferritin procalcitonin cutoff of 877, um, suggesting that a ratio of over 877 was more predictive that all this inflammation was coming from COVID. We are getting near the end and we are to the tail phase, long COVID, post-COVID. COVID for, unfortunately, a large number of people is not just a two-week viral illness. The article, Health Outcomes in People Two Years After Surviving Hospitalization with COVID-19, a Longitudinal Cohort Study, was published in the Lancet Respiratory Medicine. Uh, this was a ambidirectional longitudinal cohort study of individuals who survived hospitalization with COVID-19 and who had been discharged from Jin Yintan Hospital in Wuhan, China. I think I've heard of Wuhan before. Uh, between January 7th and May 29th, 2020, um, they measured health outcomes um, at six months, at 12 months, and then two years after hospital discharge. Um, just to sort of bring it all to the final conclusion, um, the proportion of the COVID-19 survivors that still had one symptom um, at six months was 68%. It was still 55% at two years. So the majority of these people still had at least one symptom um, at that point. The, and this is the maybe the good news, but we're going to qualify it. The paper, The Protective Effect of COVID-19 Vaccination on Post-Acute Sequelae of COVID-19, PASC, a multi-center study from a large national health research network, was also published in Open Forum Infectious Disease. They started off with an N of 25,225 that had been infected and had completed vaccination, and then matched these to unvaccinated controls. Um, after matching, there were no um, significant differences in demographics or pre-existing comorbidities, so seemingly a good match, but we'll talk about that. At 90 days following COVID diagnosis, the relative risk of hypertension was 0 0.33, diabetes 0 0.28, heart disease 0 0.35, and death, 0 0.21. Um, differences in both 28 and 90 day risk between the vaccine and no vaccine cohorts were observed for each outcome. So interesting enough, what is this paper trying to say? It's trying to say people who are vaccinated and then get COVID um, are about 80% less likely to die than those who get COVID without the benefit of vaccine. Um, 67% less likely to get hypertension, 72% less likely to develop diabetes, 65% less likely to develop heart disease. Um, but as excited as I would like to get about these results, um, I think there are several limitations. One, this is a retrospective study. And I think we all know at this point in the pandemic that vaccinated and unvaccinated people are different. Um, they're as different as far as their behavior. They're different as far as many other things. So not clear to me, is vaccination a marker or a cause? Um, so what about the rest of the world? No one is safe until everyone is safe. 
um, we are not doing well when it comes to vaccinations throughout much of the world. Um, in a lot of ways, you can sort of think about, you know, a lot of these countries sort of weathered the first two years and now the vaccines show up and um, it's a hard sell at this point. Um, there's also been a lot of vaccine misinformation in a lot of these areas, as I think I shared from firsthand experience while I was there. But I do want people to pause what they're doing right now, pause the recording, go to ParasitesWithoutBorders.com and click donate. Every little bit helps. We are now um, in our Foundation International Medical Relief of Children fundraiser during the months of May, June, and July. Donations made to Parasites Without Borders will be matched and doubled up to a potential donation of forty thousand um, dollars. We're really focused on trying to support our clinic in um, Baduda um, in eastern Uganda. Um, really struggling to keep this clinic open. Um, really takes care of over a hundred. Um, children, family members per day. Um, so really critical um, that we get your support. Time for your questions for Daniel. You can send them to daniel at microbe.tv. John writes, if I heard it right, Dr. Griffin said that Paxlovid can or should be given for asymptomatic infection. I'm confused. I thought the EUA was for use on patients with a positive test, mild to moderate COVID, and high risk for progression. You don't have COVID unless you have an illness which means at least symptoms. I think he meant to make the point that once there are symptoms, if the patient is otherwise eligible, you don't wait to see if they worsen. I wouldn't fault a doctor for prescribing Paxlovid to a very high risk asymptomatic patient, say an unvaccinated organ transplant patient, when you know the time of exposure or conversion of the test. But as I understand it, that would be going outside the directives of the EUA. Yeah. So I think this is actually helpful because we're going to talk about a couple things here. Um, one, it's going to come up to the issue of what are we allowed as physicians, as providers to do under an EUA versus full licensure? I mean, full licensure, we, we, can, we have a lot of... Uh, a lot of rope to hang ourselves on, right? Um, we can do a lot of off-label, um, but EUA, and I don't think a lot of us have, have grown up with a lot of experience about an EUA, but the emergency use authorization is supposed to be, um, here is the authorization. The authorization is just limited to what we're giving you here. Um, and if you, if you read the fact sheet, which is required when something um, gets an EUA, um, it says for individuals at high risk of progression who have mild or moderate illness, right? So mild illness would be, doesn't take a lot, but fever, coughs or throat, malaise, headache, muscle pains, um, really has a long list, but it's really, you're not a hundred percent. Um, I think a lot of the push in this direction um, came from sort of direction at the White House level. And I'll use Cam Kamala Harris, who we were told was completely asymptomatic, um, but had risk factors that prompted her to get treated. So you are right. This is right at that edge. Um, and we're sort of being pushed to expand to, to assess the EUA. But yeah, this is strictly right at the edge of the EUA. Um, I think what we've said before is that Previously, we've always kind of, you know, gone through, there's got to be something. And usually you find something. The whole idea that, you know, a high-risk individual is 100% asymptomatic, I think a lot of us are questioning. But no, right on. Strictly, this is for illness, not just asymptomatic. The next one is from Clark. And it's not a question, but it's a little bit of praise for Daniel. So it's important to read it. <laughs> Dear Dr. Okay. Griffin, I'd like to say thank you for all the time and energy you've put into educating us about SARS-CoV-2. I first heard you speak toward the beginning of the pandemic on a conference call with Kentucky providers when I was in the U.S. However, I spend most of my time in western Kenya at a relatively large referral hospital where I run the pediatrics department. And for the last few years, a respiratory isolation unit. Your weekly updates have been invaluable for me, keeping up with the literature, updating our protocols, and practices. It has been in many ways a heartbreaking few years. Last year, we had 183 mortalities from COVID in our unit as we were, are the only ones for about a four hour radius doing critical care. But I think it would have been worse without you taking the time to distill and propagate the current literature. I also really appreciate your gentle and humble demeanor in approaching what has unfortunately become a very polarizing disease. Oh, well, thank, well, thank you. I and mean, it's also nice to hear that, um, you know, in Kenya, all throughout the world, folks are listening. So thank you. And our last one is from uh, Deirdre, who writes, I wanted to thank you for your clinical updates, which have been invaluable over the past few years. I'm a physician who has been asked to prescribe Paxlovid to a patient who's traveling to Europe, specifically Italy, for several weeks 
for the patient to have on hand and take if she were to test positive while overseas, as it's not exactly clear what her access to such treatment would be if she were to get ill while there. The patient is vaccinated and 70 years of age with hypertension and obesity. From a creatinine and drug interaction standpoint, it would be appropriate. If she were to test positive in the U.S., I would prescribe Prexlovid. I know the med is not approved for post-exposure prophylaxis, but it's not exactly this scenario. And if there were significant shortages, it wouldn't be appropriate. But I'm wondering if you think this is possible or if you know what the access to antiviral drugs is in Europe. Yeah, no, so this this is actually a great question. It's going to allow me to touch on a number of um, issues. Um, so one, what about this, right? You know, and, and this sort of comes up personally for me. My parents are excited now that maybe they're going to start traveling overseas. Um, and wouldn't it be great if they just, you know, each had a, a prescription for Paxlovid sitting, you know, with them just so that should they test positive, maybe they have some home tests with them, they can immediately get started on the Paxlovid. But again, this gets into that EUA. Often when people go, you know, on a trip, travel medicine, we say, all right, I'm going to set you up with what you're going to do if you get diarrhea. Um, you know, maybe it's anti-motility agents so they don't make a mess on the bus. We've gone back and forth about whether or not they get antibiotics to have on hand. Um, but this is this is a tough uh, situation with it being under EUA uh, because this is really moving outside the EUA. This is you haven't even tested positive yet. You might test positive in the future, um, prescribing it sort of ahead of the fact. Um, so that that becomes really um, an issue. And I and I know that's going on. I know physicians are doing that. Actually, uh, got it. You got an email yesterday from a physician who is being pressured because all her colleagues in Connecticut are doing it to their patients. And and why is and she. Um, so that's a little bit of an issue. And the other thing that comes up, right, is we know that Paxlovid, um, we have the EUA, we have the data supporting um, a person tests positive and then gets treated. Um, we looked at that post-exposure prophylaxis getting started um, 72 hours after exposure. The data did not support that as an indication. Um, and also the other is keeps coming up, well, boy, I've got this trip and then I've got an event when I come back. I'd rather just start taking the Paxlovid during my trip so that I don't end up testing positive and missing that event. What if I test positive and can't get on the plane? We certainly don't have any data for pre-exposure. So um, I think those are all the relevant issues. Uh, the other, oh, no, I am, they're not all the relevant issues. <laughs> so yes, so depending on the country they go to, you can actually, so for instance, France, they have Paxlovid. Uh, for instance, I had a patient on one of the islands in the Mediterranean. Um, I had a patient in Greece. Malnupiravir was the option there. So it was really, you know, getting on the phone, having a conversation with them, then them accessing it locally. So there are ways for you to find out um, where are they going um, and what are the potential um, therapeutics available. And then also, uh, you know, a travel medicine specialist may actually be able to help direct you to how they access the local systems. That's COVID-19 clinical update number 114 with Dr. Daniel Griffin. Thank you, Daniel. Oh, thank you. And everyone be safe.